After more than 20 years of preaching the gospel of grace and denouncing the Pope as Antichrist, the world had been turned upside down again, and the authority of Rome was greatly diminished. But in response, the powers of darkness would not be silent. Satan raised up individuals in the name of Christ who then attacked those who were becoming true Christians. But Counter-Reformation is definitely Rome's plot to destroy the Protestant Reformation. What happened next was as if the bowels of hell itself had opened and spat forth the most dreadful and wicked society ever assembled. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul warned that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This was certainly true of the progressive efforts Rome put forth to fight against the teachings of the reformers and the widespread publication of the Word of God. In 1540, just one year after England had published the Great Bible, Pope Paul III would commission a new order in Rome. Their purpose was to specifically combat and, if possible, overthrow the Protestant Reformation. Rome saw the consequence of the Word of God being translated so that the people could understand without the priests. Uh, they had to meet this with some sort of opposition. This new company of priests was founded as a military order by a former Spanish soldier named Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius Loyola, actually his name was Inigo Lopez, born in Spain, 1491, has become known as the founder of the Jesuits or the Society of Jesus. Without question, the major group of individuals who throughout history have played a significant role in an attempt to bring the separated brethren back to the mother of all churches. The term separated brethren is a reference to Protestant heretics who are to be reunited with Rome by whatever means necessary. Historically, the Jesuits are known for their insidious methods of deception, spying, infiltration, assassination, and revolution. I believe you cannot understand history unless you understand the Jesuits and the role that they've played. In his book, The Babington Plot, author J.E.C. Shepard writes that between 1555 and 1931, the Society of Jesus was expelled from at least 83 countries, city-states, and cities for engaging in political intrigue and subversive plots. President John Adams, in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, once wrote, I do not like the resurrection of the Jesuits. Shall we not have regular swarms of them here, in as many disguises as only a king of the gypsies can assume? If ever there was a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is this society of Loyola's. 19th century author Edwin Sherman called them the engineer corps of hell. In this modern copy of his book, we see the assassination of Abraham Lincoln on the front cover. Because it was claimed by 19th century Catholic priest, Father Charles Chiniqui, that the Jesuits were responsible for the killing of Lincoln. Chiniqui details this in his own book titled 50 years in the Church of Rome. Lincoln himself had said, 
It is not against the Americans of the South alone I am fighting. It is more against the Pope of Rome, his perfidious Jesuits, and their blind and bloodthirsty slaves that we have to defend ourselves. Even in the 20th century, author Edmund Paris, in his book, The Secret History of the Jesuits, documents how the society influenced Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party. In particular, he says, the SS organization had been constituted according to the principles of the Jesuit order. Hitler referred to Heinrich Himmler as his Ignatius of Loyola and even obtained the swastika symbol at a Catholic abbey from a priest named Father Hagen. The Jesuit general, a position created by Loyola himself, is often referred to as the Black Pope because of the black robes he wears and the tremendous power he is said to hold. Former Jesuit general Michelangelo Tamburini once boastfully said, See, sir, from this chamber I govern not only Paris, but to China, not only to China, but to all the world, without anyone knowing how I do it. Even in modern times, Ian Paisley has spoken openly against the Jesuit order in mainstream media. He had this to say. When I explained to the press who the black pope really was, the head of the Jesuits, they again said, who are the Jesuits? And I described them as the Gestapo of the Roman Catholic Church, the front men who carry out the Pope's orders throughout Christendom. To justify his association of the Jesuits with the Gestapo, Paisley quoted from the book by Edmund Paris. He related words that were published under the authority of Francisco Franco, the Spanish dictator during World War II, shown here with Adolf Hitler. I quote from the secret history of the Jesuits by Edmund Paris. I'm giving a quotation from the reform, which is what the press of the Spanish dictator Franco published on the 3rd of May, 1945, the day of Hitler's death. Quote, Adolf Hitler, son of the Catholic Church, died while defending Christianity. It is therefore understandable that words cannot be found to lament over his death when so many were found to exalt his life. Over his mortal remains stands his victorious moral figure. With the palm of the martyr, God gives Hitler the laurels of victory. End of the quotation. Concerning this quote, Edmund Paris writes, this funeral oration is voiced by the Holy See itself. It is a communique of the Vatican given via Madrid. During the Second World War, it was the Jesuit order who put forth that the building up of the Third Reich unites a national socialist state to Catholic Christianity. In all their history, the ultimate aim of Loyola society is said to be the same as it was from the beginning. Within less than a century after their formation, Rome's Jesuit order would become an elite company of spies, assassins, and intellectuals, hated and feared by kings and commoners alike. With all these things in mind, consider that it was this society that was specifically commissioned by the Pope to launch the Counter-Reformation in 1540, under the direction of Ignatius Loyola. He decided, and along with his friends, to form some kind of an organization that would be loyal to the Pope and that would counter the Reformation. And so that's exactly what occurred. The Counter-Reformation was a way to resist what had taken place, the reforming that had occurred, and take people back to Roman Catholicism. 
Countless books and essays have been written about the Jesuits, repeatedly warning the church and others of their grand scheme to take over the world for the Pope. But exactly how would they do it? In various ways, through education, through social programs, and through infiltration of organizations to advance the cause for the Roman Catholic Church. There is perhaps no more chilling and enlightening detail than the dreadful oath the Jesuits are made to swear. This oath was well known prior to the 20th century and can be found in the Library of Congress. The oath begins with an admonition from the Jesuit superior, one that reveals the methods of infiltration used by the order. He says, my son, heretofore, you have been taught to act the dissembler, among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Calvinists to be a Calvinist, among the Protestants to be a Protestant, and obtaining their confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits. You have been taught your duty as a spy to ingratiate yourself into the confidence of heretics of every class and character, as well as among the schools and universities. The contribution of Loyola and his followers to the, um, to the Inquisition and, and to opposing the Reformation would be in the academic and educational sphere, and that they would become leaders in all disciplines of learning, and that uh, they would pursue a intensive uh, academic uh, intellectual uh, strategy which would capture the universities and the centers of learning. The plan of the society was to overthrow the Bible-based education of the Protestants. In his book on the Jesuits, Rulers of Evil, F. Tupper Saucy writes that by 1556, three-fourths of the society's membership were dedicated in 46 Jesuit colleges to learning against learning, to indoctrinate minds with the learning of illuminated humanism as opposed to the learning of scripture. This network would expand by 1749 to 669 colleges, 176 seminaries, 61 houses of study, and 24 universities, partly or wholly under Jesuit direction. In the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon warned of the impact of Jesuit education. He spoke of certain preachers saying, they keep back a portion of the gospel, having studied in the devil's new Jesuitical college. But even with their intellectual methods, the Jesuits would not abandon the centuries old practice of persecuting heretics who would not convert. As the rest of their dreadful oath reveals, the initiate is made to swear that he will do the utmost in his power to destroy all opposition to papal authority. He says, I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the poignard, or the leaden bullet, as I at any time may be directed to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Society of Jesus. Once the bloody oath is finished, the Jesuit superior says, go ye then into all the world and take possession of all lands in the name of the Pope. He who will not accept him as the vicar of Jesus and his vice regent on earth, let him be accursed and exterminated. <music> Professor Arthur Noble writes, the reinstatement of the Inquisition in the 16th century was spearheaded by the Jesuits as were its atrocities and it is estimated that in that century alone, no less than 900,000 Protestant martyrs laid down their lives for Christ. 
Among the horrors the Jesuits instigated were the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572, in which some 70 to 100,000 Protestants were slaughtered throughout France. They also famously manipulated King Louis XIV to revoke the Edict of Nantes in 1685, which had once protected the rights of French Protestants. Its revocation made the Protestant faith illegal and ultimately caused the death of half a million men, women, and children who perished in all the highways of France. King Louis's father confessor was a Jesuit priest named Pierre Lachaise. His revoking of the Edict of Nantes outlawed the reading of the Bible in France for the next 100 years. In England, the Jesuits worked closely with William Laud, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had outlawed the printing or importation of the Geneva Bible into England. We read that Laud perpetrated the greatest cruelty against Protestants who dared to support the doctrines of the Reformation. One prominent Protestant, William Prynne, had his ears twice cut off, then the stumps of his ears were dug out, others were flogged, their noses were slit in public, and their faces were branded with hot irons. Laud was eventually found guilty of conspiring with Jesuits to bring England back under popery, and was put to death for treason. Among his private papers was found a letter addressed to the Jesuit superior in Brussels. The Jesuits would also continue Rome's centuries-old persecution of the Waldenses in their dogged attempts to finally annihilate them. Several of the reformers explained why Rome hated them. Theodore Beza called the Waldenses the very seed of the primitive and pure church. He said they never adhered to papal superstition, for which reason they have been continually harassed by bishops and inquisitors, so that their continuance is evidently miraculous. Meanwhile, Heinrich Bullinger said, throughout the world, the Waldenses have sustained their profession of the gospel of Christ. In several of their writings, as well as by continual preaching, they have accused the Pope as the real antichrist foretold by the apostle John. They have consistently and openly given testimony to their faith by glorious martyrdoms and still do even to this day. The most well-known persecution of the Waldenses happened in the year 1655. And it was really uh, the armies of the Duke of Savoy, who uh, was another papal puppet, who was sent in to wipe these people out once and for all. Now the Waldenses um, managed to resist the first attack, but then Again, with Jesuit subtlety, the Catholics resorted to a different tactic and they persuaded the Waldenses that they would have another army which would come in to protect them. And sadly, the Waldenses uh, believed this. And uh, when the army, uh, when the troops, these Vatican troops were billeted amongst the Waldenses, they turned on them and carried out the most uh, horrific massacre. And it's, uh, it's known as, as in history as the Massacre of the Piedmont and it's even commemorated by the um, English poet John Milton and uh, was called on the late massacre at uh, Piedmont uh, to commemorate the sufferings of the Waldenses and uh, there are some famous lines which go um, Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints whose bones lie scattered on the Alpine mountains cold, even they who kept thy truth so pure of old, when all our fathers worshipped stocks and stones, that is to say, idols. And surviving uh, Waldenses actually appealed, or managed to appeal, to Oliver Cromwell, who was at the time the Lord Protector of England for protection. And Oliver Cromwell um, successfully managed to negotiate with Cardinal Mazarin of France to actually get the persecution lifted. But I think it's worth uh, remembering 
the uh, words, indeed the eyewitness account of one of the Waldensian pastors, uh, Jean Léger. He actually tried to persuade um, his um, Waldensian fellow believers uh, that they should not uh, fall for Rome's uh, duplicity, which uh, then, as I said, resulted in the massacre. After the massacre, he'd managed to escape. He, he came and, uh, and tried as best he could as a, a Christian pastor to minister to these uh, shocked survivors. And he even wrote about it, and he said that um, the tears mingle with my ink when I write about these deeds of darkness, yea, worse even than the deeds of the Prince of Darkness himself, because he saw firsthand the horrible cruelties that these Catholics had inflicted on these innocent Bible believers. During the Middle Ages, the Jesuits were, without question, the most radical society ever conceived. Professor Arthur Noble writes, so great, in fact, was the mischief done by the Jesuits that they were expelled from over 70 countries, four-fifths of which were Roman Catholic. And they were cursed and denounced for their hypocrisy by 11 popes. The society was repeatedly repressed and became known and feared for their revenge. In a letter to Thomas Jefferson, John Adams wrote, My history of the Jesuits is in four volumes. The work is anonymous because, as I suppose, the author was afraid, as all the monarchs of Europe were, of Jesuitical assassination. Pope Clement XIV suppressed the order in 1773 by a perpetual decree, and while signing the papal bull, he remarked, I am signing my death warrant. A year later, he died by poisoning and is said to have perished in great agony. But for Rome, the real stronghold of the Reformation was in England. The Jesuits made more than 25 attempts on the life of Queen Elizabeth I and tried repeatedly to invade the country with foreign armies. The reason for their tenacity was summed up by Cardinal Manning in 1859, who said, England is the head of Protestantism, the center of its movements and the stronghold of its power. Weakened in England, it is paralyzed everywhere. Conquered in England, it is conquered throughout the world. Once overthrown here, all else is but a warfare of detail. To understand the Jesuit goal, we must consider this statue of founder Ignatius Loyola, which can be found inside St. Peter's in Rome. Loyola stands with an open book in his hand. On one side is written the constitutions of the Society of Jesus. On the other side is a Latin phrase meaning to the greater glory of God. Meanwhile, the Jesuit's foot is found on the neck of a wild-haired figure with a serpent beneath him. The figure is said to symbolize Protestantism. Notice that Protestantism has a book beneath his arm. While there are no discernible markings on it, we ask the viewer to consider what that book might be. As we unfold the following evidence, through the Middle Ages, the source of Protestant authority was the Holy Bible, the words of God which justified all rejection of the papacy. The Bible became known as the paper pope of Protestantism, a term of derision applied by Rome. To counter the authority of the Bible, the Jesuits developed a confession for Protestants to make who converted to Roman Catholicism. Protestant converts were made to say, we confess that whatever new thing the Pope of Rome may have instituted, whether it be in scripture or out of scripture, is true, divine, and full of salvation, and therefore ought to be regarded as of higher value by lay people than even the precepts of the living God. 
We confess that the Pope has power of altering Scripture or increasing or diminishing it according to His will. We confess that the Most Holy Pontiff ought to be honored by all with divine honor, with more prostration than even what is due to Christ Himself. Let the viewer consider that these confessions are confirmed by a number of sources in the 19th and 20th centuries. We have only one of them here. On the intellectual front, the Jesuits were largely behind the Council of Trent, which began in 1545. Yes, the Counter-Reformation really got underway uh, to a major extent when Pope Paul III convened what uh, became known in history as the Council of Trent. And the Council actually ran in, I think, at least three sessions for 18 years up until the, um, the year 1563. Trent was specifically designed to refute the doctrines and teachings of the Reformation. So whatever the Reformers were for, the Jesuits were against. The key point of contention was the issue of grace and salvation. The Council declared that if anyone says that men obtain from God through faith alone the grace of justification, let him be anathema. It is worth noting that the declarations of Trent were reconfirmed by Vatican Council II in the 20th century. Vatican II is the most up-to-date doctrinal declaration from Rome. But also on the agenda at Trent were the Jesuits' attacks against the Bibles, which had been translated by the Reformers. And the Council was certainly dominated by the Jesuits, who, as I've said before, captured the universities and majored in academic and intellectual endeavors. And it was by their intellectualism and their scholarship that uh, they ultimately aimed to discredit the uh, Protestant Bibles. Well, they dominated the Council. And it appears that the major uh, resolutions of the Council uh, were, were all against the, uh, the pure Bibles, the Protestant Scriptures. In his book on the history of the English Bible, author Benson Bobrick writes that the Council of Trent had declared the Vulgate not only better than all other Latin translations, but better than the Greek text itself in those places where they disagree. And it appears also that what the Council did was to, to actually take from the writings of none other than the great reformer Martin Luther, and they just condemned these directly. Uh, for example, they condemned the belief that the apocryphal books, which are in the Catholic Bibles as part of the Old Testament, they condemned uh, the belief that the, that the apocryphal books uh, were not scripture and they were quite prepared to punish by death any so-called heretic who said that the apocryphal books were, um, were not scripture. Now it is true, it is true that the apocrypha was in uh, uh, the early Bibles. I have early Bibles in my office just across the hallway where you see the apocrypha was, some people say it's not, but in the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, the apocrypha was there. And previous to that, in the Geneva Bible, the apocrypha was there except in some uh, bootleg editions of the 1599 where it was left out. But mind you, uh, it was never to be accepted on the level of Scripture. It was never considered to be inspired while the Roman Catholic Church makes a pronouncement that it is. But Rome and her Jesuits would not be content with merely condemning Protestant doctrine. They intended to counter the Reformation Bibles. The next step of the Jesuits was to produce their own version in English of the New Testament uh, that became known as the Jesuit Reims version because it was compiled by Jesuit scholars in the town of Reims in France and later on it became known as the Douai Reims version. The Jesuits inserted curious words and footnotes into their translation in part to justify Catholic doctrine. That's why 
they work so hard to translate the Douay Reims Bible because in Matthew chapter 6, instead of saying like Wycliffe did, like Tyndale did, like the Geneva Bible, give us this day our daily bread, they say give us this day our super substantial bread, and uh, so they change, and the Greek word is not super substantial whatsoever, but nonetheless they do that to be able to support their doctrine of transubstantiation. The Dewey Reims also countered the reformers' view that the Church of Rome had been mass murdering the saints through the Inquisition. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 6, where it describes Mystery Babylon, saying she is drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, the Jesuit footnote reads, But the blood of Protestants is not called the blood of saints, no more than the blood of thieves, man-killers, and other malefactors, for the shedding of which, by the order of justice, no commonwealth shall answer. Oddly enough, the Dewey Reims also acknowledged that the Whore of Babylon symbolized the city of Rome, but they insist it must have been pagan Rome during the time of Nero.